Good morning. Has everybody beat that? Uh, <laughs> that's the time change right there. See, I'm still asleep. <laughs> it's good to be back in the Lord's house. Amen. Amen. I see we have some visitors here. Uh, we'll get you a card, sir. Brother Winford's here this morning. We are indeed glad to have everyone here this morning to worship the Lord uh, together with us. Uh, if you will, stand to your feet with me. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And I'll, I'll read you in on what we're going to do this morning. Bow with me. Our Father, we thank you and we praise you for salvation in Christ. That's all we need. We have eternal life in Him, Father. We are eternally grateful. You are worthy to be praised and worshipped this morning. We have so many other blessings aside, but if they all fell away today, we have Christ and it is enough. We are gathered here to worship you this morning. I ask that you help us to put away the distractions and the cares of this world and focus on you as our audience is one. Be glorified in what we think, say, and do here this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, now I want to welcome again our Facebook family of faith joining us live stream. We're glad you're able to join us. We, we miss you. We can't wait to see you again. But until then, sing with us because he is worthy of our praise. What we're going to do this morning is the same song that we did last week, Graves into Gardens, because we want you guys to learn it and sing with us. All right? So we have the words up on the board there, and just sing along with us, Graves into Gardens. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. But then you came along and put me back together.
That's a good way to start off a church service, is just reminding ourselves that the God we serve, okay, there's nothing like him, what he can do and what he's done in our lives, Christ, amen? All right, well, if you will, we're going to sing a couple of songs together. First, we're going to have a, a responsive reading. It's just one quick responsive reading, we're going to, and then we're going to sing, um, How Majestic Is Your Name and Glorious Is Thy Name. And again, I want to encourage you at home, sing with us, sing with us. He is your audience, not us. He can hear you where you sing. So worship with us this morning. And that's the responsive reading for you guys right there. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. There, thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Now, therefore, O God, we thank Thee and praise Thy glorious name. How majestic.
Jesus. Let me tell you, you may be seated. <clears throat> We're going to sing that short song, The Wonder of It All, because it is amazing to think about all that God made, all that He created, everything that runs so perfectly, and that He knows us each and in individually. He knows us each. He knows all the wrong, all the things we've done. Christ still died for us. Amen. The wonder of it all. First time friends worshiping with us this morning. If you'll raise your hand along with mine. Got one right down here in the middle, Brother Joe. If you'll just keep your hand up for a second when he can get to you while he's, he sprints down here. We are glad to have you with us this morning and glad to have everybody here. Some, some faces we haven't got to see in a, in a while. Uh, we're glad you're back with us uh, to worship him. All right. You can just fill that information card out, put it in the offering plate, or put it in the offering box as you go out this morning. Keep the pen as a, as a gift from us. We're glad you're here with us this morning to worship. <clears throat> Before we go to the Lord in prayer over our offering, we're going to go over some announcements, some good announcements, some exciting news. First off, Zoom meetings. I know that's not new news. Zoom meetings, though, will continue. Uh, Monday nights at 6 p.m., the Olympian Gophers class. That's led by Miss Jessica Gates. She's right, right down here. Uh, 6 p.m., that's Olympian Gophers. Those are the, the little ones. On Wednesday nights, we have the Word of Life teens and Olympians that meet at 7 p.m. on Zoom. The teens are led by Brother Jeremiah right here. The Olympians are led by my wife, Miss Carol, and Brother Philip, I think, has been teaching classes along with her. And Miss Mary, they've all kind of come together and worked as a team. Uh, and that's on uh, Wednesdays at 7 p.m. There's an adult Bible study class at, on Thursdays at 8 p.m. by Brother Winford Phillips back here, he's leading that. So if you'd like to be a part of any of these, get in touch with them. I think via Facebook is the best way to do it. They'll send you the invite, and you can join them on those classes and still take part in a service during the week. All right, here's the, the exciting news. I need a drum roll, but right now we don't have a drummer. So basis, please. <laughs> All right, choir practice. What? Oh, yay. No, no, no. Yay, choir practice, Robert. Okay, I expect a little bit more. Choir practice today at 540, no wait, 445. 445 for choir practice. Um, we are going to still maintain social distancing, but we want to try to put some songs together for Easter. Uh, work on some older things so we don't have to, so I don't have to start asking you guys to come in at 4 o'clock on Sundays because I know some people want their naps. And that's okay, but... <laughs> But uh, we will be having choir practice today, 445. For all who would like to be a part of that, come on down and join us. 
and we'll start putting some stuff together for our Easter program. Also, we will be having a sunrise service on Easter. And again, we will, we will do everything to maintain the, the protocols for safety. Uh, if you, the, you can be here at 7 a.m. for coffee and hot chocolate. The program is going to start around 7.15 a.m. And so again, that's Easter on April the 4th, the sunrise service, be here around 7 a.m. Also, Easter, Sunday evening, we'll be having Lord's Supper. I think we're going to be doing it the same way. We'll have the individual self-serve communion cups with the things in them. So be here for that. That's great news coming up for Easter as we can have some choir music and, uh, and just worship the Lord and celebrate the resurrection of Christ, our Savior, together and have the sunrise service and, and the communion service. So be looking forward to that. Tell some people about it. Let them know some exciting things going on. All right. Well, as we come to the time of worship where we give of our tithes and offerings, there's three ways that you can bring your tithes and offerings to the house of the Lord. First, you can mail it in to 2502 Lakeview Drive, Rossville, Georgia, 30741. You can go and pay via PayPal electronically. That's the information that you need. Just download that PayPal app. You can, you can uh, give by way of electronic, electronically, ele- however it's coined, I don't know. You can also bring it here. We have offering boxes in the vestibule as you come in, and as you go out the door here, there's also offering boxes. So... Those three ways to give, and we appreciate it. Missions pledge slip. If you, if you haven't already turned in your missions pledge slips for the upcoming ministry year and missions, please do so quickly. If you have one-time gifts that you want to give, please bring those in before the end of March so that we can distribute them from March throughout the rest of the year for them. So if you haven't already done that, if you need one, you can raise your hand now. Brother Joe has those. Does anybody need a missions pledge slip? Right down here, Brother Joe. Um, just fill that out, because right now they'll, they'll plan out our missions budget for the year, uh, March this year to February of next year, uh, so they can plan it out, and like I said, one time, the one-time gifts, if you can have those in before the end of March, that way they can spread it out throughout the 12 months. We do appreciate that. All right, let's go before the Lord in prayer, if you will, bow with me. <clears throat> our Father, we thank you and praise you. That is a good day to be here for worship. We have so much to be grateful for. But all we need is that one thing. We have salvation in Christ. Lord, the blessings beside just seeing faces here gathered together, my family of faith, to worship you and learn from your word. Lord, we are eternally grateful. We're grateful for the songs sung already in praise of you. And we ask now as we come to this time of worship where we give tithes and offerings that you would take what is being given and use it for your glory. Christ's name we pray. Amen. Without him, how lost would we be? Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite everyone here now to stand.
Turn to your neighbors, smile and wave. Let them know on Facebook. We miss them, we love them, wave at them. Sing together, trusting Jesus, trusting Jesus. seated. Had to have help over there. <laughs> We're going to blame that on the early, late hour change. We have Miss Meredith come up. She has a special for us this morning.
like inside it and like my battery popped open so that it's not like in there. Oh shoot, okay. Whoa. mess up, I'm going to blame it on the guitar change. <laughs> um, last year, and still through this year, obviously there's been a lot of craziness in the world going on that we're not used to, and I was one that took on a lot of anxiety for probably about the first six months of the pandemic, and um, especially... There was one day where there was some stuff going on with Raina, and uh, we had to have a little surgery done to have a scope down her throat, and that's the first time I've ever been in that situation, and I was extremely, extremely anxious. We were driving to the children's hospital, and Raina said, I want to listen to Who Sang the First Song, and that's one of her favorite songs, so I put the album on, and then like four songs later, was this song called Do Not Worry. It's by Ellie Holcomb, and it's a, it's a children's song, but I was sitting there listening to it as we're driving, and the words just hit me like a brick, and it made me realize that worrying does nothing, and although I still have anxious thoughts every now and then, this has become like a mantra for our family over the past year of just remembering who made everything, and that it's not, we can't control anything. We could, we could try our hardest to control this pandemic, and then next year something crazy happened to us that we weren't even expecting. Um, so I'm going to try and sing this. Um, this is called Do Not Worry. See the birds that are singing in the spring given everything they need they don't worry where their next meal will come from they don't worry about a thing so just look around you and try to listen to the song creation sings don't you worry cause you're in the hands of the God who made every Flowers in their colorful beauty, they're dressed better than a king. They don't worry about what they will wear, no, they don't worry about a thing. So just look around you and try to listen to the song creation sings. Don't you worry, cause you're in the hands of the God who made. was really good. <laughs> you know, Dad choked up here. It's, uh, that was good. That was good. Really good. 
All God's people said, Amen. Amen. So good to sense the presence of the Lord among God's people and to be in the house of the worship of the God who made everything. Amen. Let's take our Bible and return to the book of Jonah. Jonah. Is it toward the end of the Old Testament there? Uh, along with all those other small little books just before the Gospels and the New Testament. I want to say hello to Mom and all my relatives out there that are tuning into our services. And welcome back to many of you, the first time back in a long, long time. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord. Uh, actually, with this time change, uh, I figured uh, I figured next Sunday would be the Sunday when some of you would come. Uh, you know, when you, <laughs> when you were after adjustment for a week. Uh, the time change always throws me off, so if I, <clears throat> if I seem a little odd, it's because um, the time change. <laughs> uh, Jonah, chapter number two, but we will look in chapter number one for one verse. <clears throat> Recently, I came across a poem. It was by uh, Ethelwyn Weatherald, if I'm pronouncing her name correctly. She is a, uh, or was a Canadian poetess who lived from 1857 to 1940. She was the daughter of a Quaker minister, so a preacher's kid. She wrote about what it is like to be a prodigal on the way back home but with a heart not yet changed. In just a few sentences, the poem Prodigal Yet captures the plight of the straying child who isn't quite ready to give up the high life in the far country. Muck of the sty, reek of the trough, Blackened my brow where all might see. Yet while I was a great way off, my father ran with compassion for me. He put on my hand a ring of gold. There's no escape from a ring, they say. He put on my neck a chain to hold my passionate spirit from breaking away. He put on my feet the shoes that miss no chance to tread in the narrow path. He pressed on my lips the burning kiss that scorches deeper than fires of wrath. He filled my body with meat and wine he flooded my heart with love's white light. Yet, deep in the mire with sensual swine, I long, God help me, to wallow tonight. Muck of the sty, reek of the trough, Blacken my soul where none may see. Father, I yet am a long way off. Come quickly, Lord, have compassion on me. We ourselves, or we have loved ones who are away from God. Some of them grew up in Sunday school, went to Christian college, were raised to love Jesus. Some of them once could quote dozens of Bible verses, were leaders in youth group, went on mission trips. Maybe some were preachers or missionaries, but today they are far from God. As we think about ourselves or prodigal friends, prodigal parents, 
prodigal sons, prodigal daughters. Focus on this. Focus on this. No matter what we think about the way our friends are living, and, and no matter how angry we are at the choices that they are making, the root problem is always on the inside. Can I have a witness? As the poem reminds us, we may be in church every Sunday, smiling and singing with all the right clothes on, going through the routine, yet still with prodigal rebellion deep in our hearts. In Jonah chapter 2, we can identify with a prodigal prophet who at this point is in a whale of trouble, <laughs> pun intended. Would you look at the last verse of chapter number 1 of the book of Jonah, Jonah 1 verse 17, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. In our obstinate disobedience, God puts us in a whale of trouble. Eventually he will put us in a whale of trouble if that's what it takes to get our attention. Jonah ran in the opposite direction to God's command to preach to the city of Nineveh. Instead of Jonah's planned Mediterranean cruise to the port of Tarshish, Spain, headed that direction, God appoints a great fish to swallow Jonah, cuts the cruise short. In chapter 1, God sent a bad bad storm, almost destroying the ship that Jonah is on. So not knowing what to do, the sailors, they panic, and they start praying to any God and every God. Wake up. Everybody pray to your own God. Maybe one of them will pick up, and we can get out of this jam. Wake up. Pray. Jonah tells them, I fear the God who made everything. I fear the God who made the sea and the dry land. You've got to throw me overboard for the storm to stop. So when his out-of-control body hits the waves, God orders up a miracle fish to gulp down a prodigal prophet. And he's gone, just like that. Everybody looking over the edge. Where'd that guy go? Someone asked, why would God do such a mean thing to Jonah? I mean, Jonah, is, he's just expressing his disapproval and his disgust and his disdain of, of Ninevite society and how bad those people were. Well, I want us to understand, as long as our heart is not right with him, God will continue to bring us lower. He will continue to work on us until we are so low in life that God is our only hope and God is our only option. Can I have a witness? To get us to change our hearts, God first must get our attention. So this is not meanness. This is mercy, say amen. When God puts us in a whale of trouble, he's not paying us back for our sin. He is trying to bring us back from our sin. You see, Jesus paid for our sin, amen. Now right now, for some of us, God's trying to get our attention. God's trying to get through to us. Right here, right now, in our life. But we, being stubborn, don't want to listen. 
want to do our own thing, we're hard-headed, it's going to take an awful experience. It's going to be required in our life because we're so thick-headed and stubborn and don't want to hear and listen and don't want to walk with God. We don't want to hear what the Bible says. We don't want to listen to the preacher. We dull our ears and harden our heart. And it's going to be required. An awful, awful experience that brings us to the end of ourselves is going to be required before we'll listen and surrender to God. Now, unless God gave the miracle great fish, AC, that's air conditioning, the temperature inside that great fish would have been a hellish 108 to 115 degrees. Think about this. It was pitch black dark in there. In a living coffin, Jonah likely could not move his arms or legs very much. He was pinned in. If he was claustrophobic, oh my goodness, his panic would be off the charts as the fish dove deep and then surfaced for air, I can imagine Jonah's ears popping with the fluctuating pressure changes. Gastric juices wash over his body, bleaching him. Every hair on his body bleached. He, probably, he looked like an albino by the time he came out of there. Salt water, seaweed, and unidentified stomach contents swirled around him like a mixing bowl. And the stench was nauseating. Someone's quick to ask, what, is that even possible? No, not without God. See, this is, in your, this is not your normal whale, Okay even though we call him a whale because it was big enough to swallow a man, uh, but it's not your normal whale. This is a miracle great big fish. And you say, is that even possible? Listen, if we believe that God spoke the universe into existence with one word, and he raised Jesus Christ from the dead after crucifixion, then creating a fish to handle and instruct this prodigal prophet, it's no biggie. <laughs> it's no biggie. All right? God made this fish to swallow Jonah. And it was, it was a terrible, awful experience. Only when prodigals and disobedient children come to a crisis why does it take us having to come to a crisis before we'll turn and look up and start praying? Why does it take us hitting a brick wall before we'll start to listen to the God who loves us and made us? It takes a crisis before we'll recognize it's time. It's time to surrender to God. You see, God does what he needs to do to bring us to the place where we remember him. I want you to look now at chapter 2, book of Jonah, verse number 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Now think about this. Jonah laid in the darkness, stubborn and unmoved, for three days. This shows the depth of Jonah's rebellion against doing God's will. God told Jonah, go and preach my mercy and my grace and my forgiveness to those sinners in Nineveh, to those wicked people in Nineveh, you go preach my grace and mercy and forgiveness to them. Now, you got to remember one of Nineveh's primary military targets and place of wartime atrocities 
was the area of Israel where Jonah was born and grew up. And I think some of his relatives suffered or even were killed with the torturous things that the Assyrians and the Ninevites did to his family or friends, maybe even to Jonah himself. So this is like God telling a Jewish preacher to go to Auschwitz during the World War II Holocaust and preach God's mercy and grace and forgiveness to the Nazis. Preach to the Nazis that God wants to forgive them and loves them and he has grace and forgiveness. Take that message to Dr. Mengele, the angel of death at Auschwitz. He oversaw ghastly medical experiments which 99 out of 100 times killed the Jewish men, women, and children patients that he was working on. Preach to the Nazis. That's what, that's what, that's what Jonah is, is, is feeling like God's asking him to do. You want me to give forgiveness and grace and mercy and love to the Nazis? For three terrifying days, I can imagine Jonah shaking his head. No, no, talking to himself. Nope, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do what God wants. I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it. Before we're too hard on Jonah, there's a lot of us, in fact, I think all of us, willing to obey God up to the line there's an invisible line. We're willing to obey God up to the line where it touches the core of who we are and the core of what we desire. You see, some of us will not obey God in romance or dating and relationships. Every other area, we're, we're willing to obey God. But our love life, oh, uh, no, that's one area we insist on controlling see our boyfriend our girlfriend our companion our pleasure is too important to us to give to God some of us will not obey God in the area of money we will not be generous we're just not going to we will not give up certain luxuries to invest in the mission of God we will not tithe because money is a thing that provides meaning and security in our life some of us will not release our children to the will of God. We want to be in control. Some of us will not obey God about how much we work. We will not turn it off even though it's harmful to our family. Some of us are not willing to release our anger, our tongue, our vices or our habits to God's control. Others of us will not surrender our life and say, God, use me here or anywhere. We're just not going to say that. We don't want to surrender. We are willing to obey God in all different easy areas up to the line, up to the line where it touches our core being. And then we say, nope, not going to happen. How many of you parents, <laughs> how many of you parents had a child? You told them, I want you to go to your room. And they said, no. Son, go to your room. You ain't the boss of me. No. Not gonna happen. That same feeling that you get as a, as a mom or dad, that same feeling you get when they're talking back like that, that's the same feeling God gets when we talk back to him. Hello? Give me an Amen. We all talk back to God. I want you to raise your hand in confession. I have talked back to God. Raise your hand. 
I have talked back to God. I'm going to make sure everybody's got all their hands up. There shouldn't be a single one that said, I have never talked back to God. You're a liar. So God has to do something about that. Just like we usually ground our children or we uh, take something away, maybe even discipline them. God uses calamity. He uses sickness, loss, repeated failure, and heartbreak to bring us to the point where we remember the Lord. I want you to look. Chapter 2, verse number 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried, watch this, by reason of my affliction. The reason I'm praying is because I'm afflicted. My affliction has brought me to the place where I am praying unto the Lord. And he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I. It was hot in there. And you heard my voice, for you had cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, or in the heart of the seas. And the floods compassed me about. That's old Elizabethan English. The floods surrounded me. All your billows and, and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about, or surrounded me, or pressed me in, or came and pressed all around me. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I wrote in my Bible, seaweed turban. <laughs> I thought that was good. Uh, let me, seaweed wrapped about my head, seaweed turban, turban, that's what I call it. Anyway, verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever, couldn't move. Yet have you brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God, when my soul fainted within me, everybody read it out loud with me, the next four words, I remembered the Lord. Everybody together. I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto you, into your holy temple. I want you to notice the first part of verse 4. Where Jonah said, I am cast out of your sight. See, twice in chapter 1, the Bible reads that Jonah fled from the presence of the Lord. Because he spit in God's face with obstinate rebellion, Jonah thought that he caused God to forsake him and forget him. Out of sight, out of mind. See verse 4? Then I said, I am cast out of your sight. I think some of us feel like that. Some of us feel like that we have run so far away from Christ and his church that we've caused God to mark us off his list. Our life is so full of chaos that we feel like we are in the heart of a pumping sea. Floods of trouble slap us around. But the truth is, the truth is we have not been forgotten by God. Amen. Amen. The broken heart, the financial frustration, the lost job, our failing health are appointed by God to bring us to remembrance. 
Verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, say it with me again, I remembered the Lord. When I was at the end of my ropes, when there was no other options, when all was falling in in my life and caving in, there was no place to turn, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto you, into your holy temple. Listen, when we are so soaking wet that we can wring water out of our soul, it's time to turn to God. All right, did you catch that? I love that, verse number five. The waters surrounded me even to the, say that word, soul. <laughs> That's wet. When, when your soul gets wet, you are wet. It was hopeless. When I was a teenager, there was a quartet at our church, just made up of regular members in the congregation, that would sing a song that came to me when I was uh, studying this passage. I'm, I'm just going to get my uh, key here so I can sing it for you. Well, if you've got mountains, you can't climb, and if you've got rivers, you can't cross, and if you got valleys that you can't span, let Jesus take a hold of your hand, give up and let Jesus take over, give up and let Jesus take over, give up and let Jesus take over and he'll make way for you now if you got burdens to hard to bear, and if your load is more than your share, kneel down and talk to Jesus. Cause I, I know that he cares and he'll make a way for you. Sing it. Give up and let Jesus take over. And let Jesus take over, give up, and let Jesus take over, and he'll make a way.
You believe that? Say amen. Give him glory. Sure. Give him glory. Thank God for Jesus. He will make a way for you. See, our Heavenly Father, He loves us so much that He is relentless in His pursuit of those of His children who are out of the way. He brings us a whale of trouble. He brings us mountains we can't climb. He brings us rivers we can't cross. He brings us valleys we can't span. He brings us burdens that are too hard to bear, not because he wants to harm us, but because he wants to help us. Jonah knew. Okay, Jonah knew from the get-go who was hosting his trip. Would you look at verse number three? Look at verse three. For you, O God, had cast me into the deep. The reason I'm in this deep water is because you put me there in the heart of the seas. And the floods surrounded me. Watch, all your billows, Lord, all of your breakers, Lord, all of your waves were passing over me. You see, only when prodigals and disobedient children come to a crisis do we recognize, you know what? It's time to surrender to God. It's time to stop fighting. It's time to let go and let God. You see, I think, and I know really from the Bible, that God knows bringing us a, a whale of trouble, it clears, clears our minds to think about what matters most. Okay, look at verse 8. Look at verse 8, chapter number 2. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But Jonah says, nope, I will sacrifice unto you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed and promised. Salvation is is of the Lord. And I love verse 10. And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it puked out, vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. That was nasty. <laughs> With 24 verses before it and 23 verses after it, the whole book of Jonah pivots on verse 8. Look back at verse 8. It seemed strange in his prayer, but it, it makes sense in the whole book. Pivots on this one verse. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. And let me, let me paraphrase this, kind of maybe help clear it up some. Those who cling to vain idols, they forfeit God's grace that could be theirs. Okay, we go out there and we think that sex is going to satisfy us. That vain idol lies. We think money is going to satisfy us. That vain idol lies. We think power we think relationships, we think anything out in that world that we think is going to satisfy that deep place in our heart lies. And those who cling to lying, vain idols forfeit God's grace that could be theirs. Okay, Jonah, Jonah thought it would be better to disobey and hold on to the idols that he loved than to obey and hold on to God. He made that decision. 
You say, well, I don't have those little idols, those statues, and I don't bow down and pray to them. Well, let me, let me kind of bring this up speed for you, okay? An idol doesn't have to be a little statue. An idol is anything we love more than God, trust more than God, and crave more than God. See, Jonah valued his life, identity, and racial hatred against Nineveh more than he valued God. Martin Luther wrote, To whatever we look for any good thing and for refuge in every need, that is what is meant by God, little g idol to whatever you give your heart and entrust your being that i say is really your god following luther's writing to what do we most look for good things do we look to money do we look to people? What can we not live without? What are we bitter about having lost? What are we envious that others have that we don't have? What do we stay up late at night worrying about losing? What is the one thing that we say, without that, life is not really worth living? Where do we go for refuge? What brings us the greatest source of comfort? Where do we turn when life gets tough? Do we turn to our friends, our family? Do we turn to booze? Do we turn to drugs? Do we turn to food, spending money, shopping? Do we turn to a, a girlfriend, a boyfriend? Now, these things are usually not in themselves bad things, but we've given our hearts. When we have given our hearts to them, entrusted our being to them, as Yoda would say, idols. They have become to us. Idols they have become. So Jonah says, after three days and nights in this hellish, putrid, dark fish gut, I've learned my lesson. I have learned my lesson. Look at verse 8 again. They that observe lying vanities and cling to the idols of this world forsake their own mercy and grace that God would give them. But I will sacrifice unto you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have promised. Salvations of the Lord. And the Lord spoke unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. See, for some of us, and it's so sad, I hate it when I have to preach funerals of these kinds of people. They die clinging to their vain idols, forfeiting God's grace that could have been theirs. Rather than do that, rather than do that, how about following Jonah's example? Okay, verse 9. I will sacrifice unto you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have promised. Salvation is of the Lord. You see, God getting us to a place where we are humbled enough to see the depth of our need and confident enough to see the depth of his grace a lot of times that's a pain-filled process. 
One author wrote, Jonah is going to emerge from the belly of the fish, fully surrendered to do God's will, but he still hates the Ninevites, and he is still bitter at God. He will obey, but he does not want because he does not want to get back into that fish's belly. So he will obey, but he's not going to be a happy camper. He is not going to be happy about it. Which, if you take a, if you think for a second, that is supposed to give us a great picture of religious people. Religious people. They know it's stupid to run from God, but they've never learned to love others like God loves. Say amen. See, Christianity seems to have two versions, 1.0 and 2.0. Christianity 1.0, we recognize the stupidity of idolatry and we surrender. In 2.0 Christianity, we move it up and we recognize the greatness of God's undeserved grace and mercy. And that's when our heart really changes. That's when our heart changes. As we'll see moving forward, even though Jonah's willing to pay his dues and obey God outwardly, The Lord is yet to do a work changing Jonah's heart. Yeah, I'll come to church because you make me. But as soon as I'm out on my own, I'm not going. That's Jonah. Jonah's on his way home, but with a heart not yet changed. And like the poem we began with, Jonah is inwardly a prodigal yet. And I think that's where a lot of us are, if not most of us. Religious outside, anybody looking at us would say, you know, pretty pretty fine Christian right there. Religious outside, yet rebel inside. God is, is not after just our outward obedience. God is after our outward obedience that's blossoming from a heart of loving like he loves. Can I have a witness? But first, God needs to bring us to the place of yielding our will to his. Only when prodigals and disobedient children come to a crisis Do we recognize it's time? I think it's time. It's time, isn't it? It's time that we surrender to God. Let's stand. With every head bowed and eyes closed, you and our online congregation, if you will bow your heads also with us, please. In our online congregation or in our in-person congregation, First thing you need to do, examine your heart. Look into your heart. Ask yourself, though religious, am I a prodigal yet? Are there areas of my life and heart that I am not willing to give up for God? Do I value those things more than I value God. Depending on how you answer those questions will determine how God will deal with you in the days ahead. See, God loves you too much to let you stray too far. Give up and let Jesus take over. Right here, right now, you can make a course correction. Right here, right now, you can trust Jesus to forgive your sins by believing that he died in your place because of your sins and he rose from the dead. 
And by believing that sincerely in your heart and confessing his name, the Bible says you will be forgiven and receive the gift of everlasting life. On the other hand, if you're a believer already, but you know your heart is not in tune with Christ and his church, right here, right now, you need to remember the goodness of God in your life. Repent and live for Jesus like you mean it. Jonah was an upstanding believer, but his heart was stone when it came to Nineveh. What is it that makes your heart stone when God asks you to give that to him and to offer it to him? What is it that makes your heart stone? Have you surrendered? Has God brought you to this point? See, repentance comes from desperation. Realizing the futility of idols and understanding salvation belongs to the Lord. Yield to God. Give up and let Jesus take over. And then for those of us with prodigal friends or family members, I want you to take heart. No matter how far they go off course, God is working to get their attention. Amen. What do we have, Brother Robert? I surrender. I surrender all. Let's sing that from our hearts. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all let's bow our heads for a word of prayer Heavenly Father, we are all Jonah. There's a Jonah in every single one of us. We tell you no. We turn our backs. We spit in your face. We trample underfoot your grace and sacrifice of your dear son. And yet you still seek us, work in our lives, bringing whales of trouble, mountains we can't climb, rivers we can't cross, valleys we can't span, burdens too hard to bear to get our attention to help us remember hey I'm here I will help you I will redeem you I will save you if you will turn to me father I pray for the prodigals of our families sons and daughters sometimes fathers and mothers brothers and sisters, other family members, best friends that we know are on a collision course with a brick wall. We pray for them that it doesn't take that, but if it does, that once they hit that crisis point, that they will recognize that your Holy Spirit would speak to their hearts and they would recognize it's time to surrender to you. And then even as we stand in your presence in the house of worship, I pray, Lord, we would examine our own hearts and in areas that we've yet to surrender to you, I pray that we would give them into your hands. 
And I pray it in the strong and matchless name of Jesus. All of God's people said, amen. All right, we want to say so long to our online congregation. We will be asking you to tune in tonight for the message, Live by Faith as well as Saved by Faith. Faith. I want you to come back uh, and tune in tonight's message. You in person, come back, and then you on.